Hello, welcome back to Go on the Run. And so today we're going to do the last part in building generic Docker images. And this was all to get us familiar and comfortable with how Docker images work and Docker in general, and how we can build, um, customize our own images. And so one of the last thing we're going to do in this video is look at how you can mount external volume or directories into your images. Now, if you like what's happening here and you like what I'm doing, you're enjoying the material, you like the channel, please do me a favor and hit the subscribe button. Also, while you're doing that, hit the notification bell so that you can be notified when I post videos. All right. And if you don't mind, also give a thumbs up to the video. Before we jump into the material, if you haven't already subscribed yet, please consider subscribing if you like what you're seeing, you enjoy the material, like this channel, please subscribe and spread the word. If you haven't hit the notification bell yet to be notified when I post videos, please do that because if you're subscribed, chances are you want to know when I post videos. And so definitely hit the notification bell for that. And if this video was helpful to you or you learned something, please hit um, the thumbs up on the video, leave a comment, you know, let me know how the material is going, how you're enjoying the material. And of course, that also let other people know that oh, it's great content. And this is how the YouTube algorithm, you know, put the videos in front of other people for them to see it also. So we need the engagement essentially, which means people thumbs up the video, commenting, and of course, like subscribing and hitting the notification bell. All right, so let's get started. If you remember, we talked about like, what is a Docker image and quickly just to recap, so we can all be on the same page. We said it's, oh, it's a binary object. It contains a bunch of, you know, things that allow you to create a container. And of course, once you have a running container, you know, you can have files in it, which we've seen, we can export ports and we can define those in the image and then have a container when it's running, expose those ports. And we saw how to map those ports. Today, we're gonna to look at mountain paths. Now this is the same screen I've been showing for like the past three or four videos. So, but it's just always for us to reset. So let's now talk about mountain volumes. All right, in the previous video, I said path, but I'm gonna use path and volumes interchangeably and you're gonna see why. So let's imagine that we have our host operating system. Your host is where you're running Docker and that host um, is gonna allow you to create Docker containers. So let's say we create a container here with the ID 1ABC. Now we know that in the host, there are gonna be some directories and files that is gonna be specific to that host. Remember we talked about this when we talked about the introduction to what is Docker and so on. We said, oh, is this way of having things that are isolated, processes that are isolated from each other. And one of the reasons for that is that your OS operating system can have a set of files and your container can have a separate set of files and they all separate. And so even if your host have Etsy directory and slash home, your container could have the same thing, but those two set directories or those set of directories are completely separate. We've seen this already. Now, what if, what if you had a directory on your host operating system, let's call it C data for now. And you had a directory on in a container called data. Again, it could be any name. And what you really like is instead of them being isolated from each other, you really want these two directories to be linked. Notice your Etsy home, uh, Etsy directory and your home directory are separate in each container. But in this particular instance, you want these two directory to be one and the same, which means files that are in the host in this directory should appear in the container and files that are written by in the container by the container into its slash data directory should automatically appear or show up in the slash data directory. How can you pull out something like this? Well, it's pretty simple actually. Just like how we use the minus P option when we use the Docker container to map ports between the host machine and the container, well, we use minus V to map a volume or a directory that's on the load or host to a directory that's in the container. And that's all there is to it. And notice this the same order of things, right? Where the host pad comes first, then the container, just as when we use minus P, it's the host port followed by the container port. 
Let's talk about a use case. Why might you even want to be able to do something? Maybe we go through all this trouble to get something like Docker that give us con um, process isolation, keep our files separate, and all this thing. We talk about security and everything, all those benefits that a container gives you. So why might we now want to go back to where we have the ability to have files that are mapped between the host and the container? I remember in this scenario, we can have these files be live, as you will see in our demo. Now, there's more complicated things you can do where you can say that the files are only read only from the point of view of the container, where it can only read files that are on the host and it doesn't able to modify it. But in this example, what I'm gonna give you, very simple, I want the files to be writable. And so here's a scenario. Let's say you have your container and it's running like your API server, for example. Like if you remember in our previous example, we wrote this very simple API application that exposes a, exports a port and listen for requests. And let's say we were want to write logs every time somebody connect to our API and use it because we want to be able to keep track of who's connecting from where, how often, that sort of thing. And we write in log files. Now, if for some reason our container got corrupted, either because somebody pushed something that's invalid, um, some other application or virus got on there and wiped out our Etsy directory to cause trouble, whatever it is. Um, if that were to happen, I know our container was corrupted and no, we couldn't use it or repair it. Now, what we can do is delete that container, don't worry about it, and just create a new container but because we were mapping the data that was being written by that container to a directory that was mapped to the host, well, the data would already be on the host. So when we delete our container, the data is now on our host. And that's why when we create a new container and map it to the same directory, guess what? Our new container just has the same data that it could continue. All right, so that is a simple use case of why you might want to do this. Um, this comes in very handy when you want to run like databases inside of containers. You might want the actual data to be stored outside of the container so that again, if you destroy that container running the database, you still have the data that you're storing in the database. So that's another example. So, okay, so let's jump to the command line and look at how we can do this. So I'm going to start off where we left off the last time. So I'm going to start with part two and I'm going to simply call it part three by copying the part two directory and I do minus R for recursive. And then I'm gonna start by Visual Studio Code in the part three directory. So I'll leave that at that. Okay, so to demonstrate what I'm talking about and like the use case, let's imagine, like I said, that for application, let me make this a little bit bigger and let's zoom in a little bit more um, for those of you who might be on small devices and need to see. So let's imagine that what we want to do is to be able to start adding a log file to our, let me close this up, add a log entry, and we're gonna append. Every time somebody make a request, we're gonna append an entry to our log so that we can later go back and look at our log file and see, you know, like you say, who connected at what time and so on. So what I'll do is just below here, I'll write a function and say add, log entry and so um the way we'll do that is we'll say add log entry is the name of my function and so what do i want to pass this function i want to pass the time that we get this request i also want to record um which host because maybe um you know like i said our container might go away and we might need to write to the same file if it's just one server i'm running and so I should know which server probably is running and writing this log entry. So um, that can tell me how many times maybe my server failed and had to be restart, um, recreated. So I'll do that. And then I'll, of course, I want to save the remote address of who is connected. Okay. And so for my function, then I can do func and I want to do add log entry is the name of my function. It doesn't return any value, but of course it takes some parameter. And so it takes a parameter. Let's call it just T for time and time the time. And then we have the local host and the remote host, and those are string. Okay. 
So that's essentially it. Now, I don't really like doing parameters like this, but even though both of those are string, I prefer to make it explicit like that. Okay, so now we have everything we're passing to our log entry function. What is it that we want to do here? Like I said, we want to append a file, so which means we have to open the file, add something to it, and then close it, right? So every time we get a call, open the file, write something, close it, and that's it. And so what we should do is use os.open and so there are two open functions in the OS package. And so one of them is just open and you just give the string. And this opens a file um, for read only. And if we go to the open files one, this is more generic and you can pass some parameters to see the flags to see how you want to open this file. And so this is the one we want to use because we want to say open a certain file, which is going to be our log file. And we want to use some flags. So what flag should we use? It says here that our flag is just an int. Now, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about OR and build Boolean operation. But if you need a refresher or you don't know anything about Boolean operation, definitely check out my Go line course. I might have covered it here in Go on the Run, but definitely in my course, I cover um, Boolean like and or and all those sort of thing. So definitely check it out there. So what do we want? So we want an OS flag that says that oh, we should create the file if it isn't created. So for example, the first time we're going to try and open this file, OS that um, write only, because when we open this file, we don't want to read. So we're just going to be writing to it, which makes sense. So we create it for writing. And so th those two things would do that. But if the file already exists, we also want to be able to append to it. And so there we go. And so what a pen does is if we open it with a pen, it already moved the offset where we would be writing or reading from to the end of the file. And so if this doesn't make any sense, think of a file as a really, really big buffer that can grow. And so when you open the file, where should that offset be or the insertion pointer? Is it should, should it be the beginning of the file or the end of the file or somewhere else? And of course you can move it around with the seek um, method for a file, but we're not interested in any of that. So those are only three um, flags that we need or together, and that's going to give us what we want. In terms of permission, look at this. The permission is an OS file mode. And if we were to hover over this, you'll see it's just a 32-bit unsigned in 32-bit. So we could just type in numeric value, but we can also do something like this. And if you don't know Unix permission, Again, I can't stop and try to teach you that now, but something you can do like Unix permission and go to Wikipedia and you should see a lot. But basically it's always specify how, what permission we should create this file with. And so six means that oh, it should be readable and writable by the owner. And then four means that oh, it should be readable by people in the same group as the owner. And this four means it should be readable by anyone outside um, or world readable. Again, if this doesn't make any sense, um, spend some time looking at that. So we need a file or a log file. So I'll go back up here and I'm going to do const and I'm going to say log file is equals to, let's call it server.log. That's the name of our log file. And um, so let's see what else we, oh yes, yeah, so we open the file. We're going to get back the file handle, essentially, not handle, but file object, and an error. So we're going to get f, colon, error, something like this. And we go to the end here, and we check for error. And if we have an error, we're not going to be too ceremonial about it. We'll just do log fatal and, you know, kick that out. If everything is OK, we can defer, defer, um, close in this file, f that close for later when we're about to exit from this function. So we don't have to think about it or how we get out of this function. It's gonna just take care of closing the file for us. And then the next thing we wanna do is actually write to the file. And that's pretty easy. We can use fprintf and say we wanna to write to this file. And what we wanna write is, let's say the current time, a tab, and then something like API server and we give the server name that we're running on. This is this server. We can say what our message is, is connection from, you know, let's say it's a connection from, and then we can do no, however we want, connection from this host, and then a new line. And so 
time, which is T, which we passed in. And then we want to do local host, for example, and then remote host. So that's our log entry, right? Now, since this is a server log and we might need to sort or what and might need to sort the entries and so on, um, even though it's going to be written one after the other, but maybe let's say we have several log files and so on, we want to sort them. It, we should write it in a format where it makes sense that when we sort each line, it can appear chronological. And so for that, what we should do is call t that format. And we should say, how is it exactly we want this to be format? So there's this method and it takes a string of auto format things. And there, we could type in our own format string here that you know, satisfies a certain rule, but there are also some that are already provided. And so I'm gonna use RFC 3339. Now, you might be thinking, why RFC 3339? So let me just go show you. So here are those some of those formats. And of course you can come up with your own because they're just strings. And so by default, I think it does something like, like this, you know, the day and month and so on. And that is not sortable, right? Because if I sort on the day of the month, um, the day of the name of the day, then, you know, sometimes we choose it Thursday, it's going to be sorted next Tuesday and Thursday can be sorted next to each other. But, you know, um, you know, Thursday is going to come before Tuesday. And so that's not good. But generally log file have a format, something like this where you have the year first, which sort of makes sense. And so that you can sort by year, then month, then day. So you get from very high level or course to more specific, right? And then the time and some log file will use a space here, but here they, are, they have T to specify time. So that's fine, great. And so hour, minute, second, and then time zone. And so this is the in the format we're going to use RFC 3339. So that's why I use that. Okay. And so we're going to write a new line. We're going to, that's it. You know, our file is going to be closed at the end of this function call. And so what about this? Okay. So this looks like it's going to write our file in slash root directory. So maybe we want to put it in some, let's call it log directory is equals to slash data. So that's where we want to put it. And here we want to say log dir plus, and so we do it that way. So that way, if we wanted to come back and change the log directory or make it some um, parameter, we can you know change these to vars instead, and then expose them as parameters. Okay, so with that in place, there's only one other thing we need to do because we need this directory to exist slash data. So just trying to create a file or open a file in that directory would not create the directory. We'll get is, you know, file or something doesn't exist and our program will fail. So we should create the directory, but we can do that very easily. I mean, of course we can do it in code, but we can also do it here when we make in our image and we can say that why not make that, um, do the run command and do make directory and we do minus p and we'll do slash data. I like type in minus p just because I come if I come back and decide to add more sub directories here, then I don't have to worry about a parent being created. So this minus p means pre create parent. So now I think we are all set. So let's build our application and then um, and of course so let's clean up and if we're gonna build it we have to build it for um, Linux. So let's do that. Uh, we need to be in part three and we need to be specifically in the app directory. Um, oh, there we go. We don't need to be in that directory. We just do there and then we do um, go OS build and let's clean up. And so that's finished. And then we can verify this by doing this. Oh, uh, you know what? Uh, hey, remove that. And um, I think we have to, let me remove this too. So let's do go OS minus out and let's call it app. There we go. And file app, and we can see that always ELF. Let me clean up. And so Docker bill. So Docker bill, I have this in my history already, bill command. And so I'm going to do build and I'm going to call it part three that one, because we were doing part three, and this is our first build. So that's what I'm going to call it. And so if I run this, all right, 
So you can see nothing new, we just make that data directory and prepare it. So okay, so now let's create a container from our image. So we'll say Docker run and we'll do minus D for put it as a daemon. I'm not going to use minus minus RM because um, that defeats the purpose. Like we, we want to say our container is going to run in and if it fails, well, then we remove it. But I'm not going to use minus minus RM. But what I'm going to do is going to use minus minus name and call it app. So this is the name for a container. So the way we don't have to try and worry about what crazy, um, you know, ID it, it end up getting. So we just always use name. And then um, the next thing we want to do is our port. So last time we did minus capital P to just have it map to any random host port. But I want to again tame things a little bit and I don't have to guess and look for it. So I'm going to say map it to port 8080 locally, but our container was configured to export port 80. So I'll say map it to port 80 in the container. And then this was our image. Um, image. So if we run this now, so that's running. And so we can do Docker logs, for example, minus follow the logs, or you can say follow the container for F. And so uh, we can see that oh, we only log one message. And so because it's following, it's kind of stuck there and it doesn't do anything, but that's okay. So let's do a curl to our local host port 8080. And so now we see a message and that's fine. So let's do run another message. And so, yeah, we're getting messages back from our container. Um, that's great. Now we don't see anything outside, but if we were to go into that container Docker, exec minus um, interactive, and then we say that we want to go into the container app, we want to run the bash shell. And now we're in this container, you can see it's 4754, which is exactly where we're getting back here. So that tells us that oh, we're actually in the container. And so if we do ls, there's nothing there. But if we do data, we should see server.log. And so if we do cat of data server.log, you can see we made two requests and they're both here in our container. And you can see the format, how they were written. And so we see the container ID. All right, so let's pretend that how this corrupt container got corrupted as you can see, data was written into the container. The container got corrupted, and now we need to delete it. So Docker RM, I'm going to say minus F for force, which means don't worry about stopping it. If I try to remove a container that is not stop, it will tell complain that you can remove a running container. But with minus F, I'm saying stop it and then remove it. So now our container is gone. But where's our data? Our data was in that container. I remember it was all isolated. So we've lost all the history of whoever use our, our um, site or our um, API. So the way we fix that, we don't have to check, change our code at all. What we have to do is come back here in Docker and we can say that what we want to do is have a volume. And you can see from the help, it says that create a mount point with a specified name and mark it as holding externally mounted volume from the native host or from other containers. Yes, I forgot to mention that you can also mount um, from one container to another, but you know, that doesn't matter. And so here we can see it all, it suggests that data, but it doesn't have to be. So we can leave it there because that's exactly the directory where we want, we want to um, expose. Okay, so that's all there is to it. Remember, if we don't mount anything, it's just gonna use the directory that's been created for the container anyway, and we did that in here. All we're saying now is that this directory is exportable, and it can be mounted to match something on the host. So what we should do is rebuild our um, our image. So Docker build. And so this is the second time we're building it, but we're still in part three. And so let's do that. So let's clean up. And now let's try and run a container. Um, but this time, we have the ability to mount something. So let's do this. Let's make a directory called logs here. And so I'm gonna go back here and notice that we have this directory called logs. There's nothing in this directory right now. I can close this. So let's um, try running our application. So if we do Docker run, and this time we build it as part 3.2. So let's change that. We're still going to be connected to the same port, but now we're going to use minus V. 
and we want to see the local directory that we want to use to connect to. And so we'll use a local doc directory called logs. So how do we get to that directory? Well, I want to use the current directory that I'm in. So I'm going to say get the current working directory. So that dollar sign open parentheses and close parentheses just simply mean run the pwd command in a subshell and return the output. And so output is going to be my current working directory, the full path, and append to it logs. And then, of course, I want to see map my local directory to slash data in my container. And that's it. And so if I run this, the directory doesn't have to exist for us. If I just run it, it's going to create the directory. And I can say Docker logs if I like to see if there's any problem starting my server. And it doesn't look like there was. It looked like it's it run successfully. At least it didn't report an error. And so, but there's no file in it right now. Uh, remember, we don't write a file until we actually do a request. And so I do curl. And you can see I get a this message saying that oh, um, the container ID is EDD, which we see up there. And if I go back here, now notice I have the file called server.log. It's proving that oh, from within my container, I was able to create this file server.log and it's reflected on my host. Remember, I'm not inside my container right now. So let me just close this like this. And so we can see there's the server host name, my container host name, if you like. And so if I run this a couple more times, as you can see, as I make requests, they're going in to this log file. All right, so here's the test. Let's clean up. Imagine that our someone, or for whatever reason, we have to remove this container or it's corrupted or we need to upgrade our application. No problem. We remove it and we rerun a new, we run a new container and bam, we run the same command. Notice we get a completely different container and we do some requests to that container too. And as you can see, it's appending to the same file because the file was saved on our system. And because we were logging the host which wrote the file, now we can see there were two different containers or host that was written that wrote this file, wrote to this file. So there you can see that how we're able to persist the data beyond the lifespan of the container, right? Our container can come and go, but the data still persists. And that's, like I said, is a good use case, not for only what we're doing, but like if you're using a database or something, you're running something like a MySQL progress or MongoD um, within a container, you, may, you still want that data probably to persist long after the container goes away. And so let's just clean up. And so I think that's enough. Again, if you reach this part, you like what you're seeing and you're not subscribed, why not? please hit the subscribe button. If you're gonna subscribe, you certainly wanna know when I post videos, please hit the notification bell so you can be notified. And please give this video a thumbs up if you like how I presented the material, you learned something from it, and you would like others to be able to find this type of material. Please, please give it a thumbs up. Leave a comment just saying hi or whatever what your thoughts are on the video or something. Um, I certainly take suggestion. Um, I have tons of suggestions of things to work on. I just need the time, but Hopefully with the growth of the channel, maybe one day I'll have the time to do that sort of thing. Thanks for your time. Take care. Stay safe. See you in the next video.